Uh, good evening, commissioners and staff. Uh, any any members of the public uh, who have uh, who have joined in? So we're calling to order the June seventeenth, twenty twenty one meeting of the Harbor Commission. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, would you do a roll call, please? Yes, of course. Commissioner Kramer. Yes, present. Oh, she is present. Commissioner McRae. He is absent. Commissioner Nelson. Here. Commissioner Sloan. Here. Commissioner Stanowick. Here. Commissioner Studman. And Chair Sly. Here. Thank you. Do we have any changes to the published agenda tonight? Commissioner Chair Sly, no, no, no changes to the agenda today. Okay, and um, I didn't see any uh, public input uh, on the website this afternoon. Um, but are there, uh, are, is anyone signed up to speak on any items that are not on the agenda tonight? Hi, Commissioner or Chair Sly. There was no public comments that were submitted prior to the meeting for this meeting. But um, at the time, there's no hands raised. But I do want to remind the public that if they would like to make public comment, to please indicate that by clicking the raise and lower your hand icon on the control panel, and I'll alert you when it's your turn to speak, and you'll have two minutes. But at this time, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first item on our agenda is uh, approval of the minutes of the June um, moment here. I'm sorry, the May May 20th, uh, 2021 meeting. Uh, and before we ask for uh, a motion uh, to approve those minutes, uh, does anyone have any uh, corrections or changes they would like to suggest to the to the published minutes? Um, okay, hearing none, we entertain a, a motion to approve uh, the minutes as as written. I shall move. And a second. Second. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed or abstentions? Okay, uh, the minutes pass. Uh, the second item. Uh, Hang on, like, I'm, I'm abstaining because I wasn't there. So, sorry, I had my- oh, That's right, you weren't, you weren't there. Okay, um, thanks. Um, the second item is the director's report and uh, Mr. Wilshire, would you give that? And, and then we can, uh, if you would, just segue into the other three uh, staff reports. Perfect, will do. Well, uh, good evening, commissioners and Chair Sly. Um, again, members of the public and anyone tuned in, I'm, I'm Mike Wilcher, Waterfront Director. So we've got a semi-full agenda, so I'll just get right into my, my director's report. Um, next slide, Angela. All right, so I'm, um, really hoping that this is my last uh, coronavirus update. Um, a, a lot's changed out there since our last meeting in May with regards to COVID. So my hope is that, that this month will be my, my last. I'll move away from these COVID updates um, as the city and the state and really us, the waterfront, begin to open back up. So we were really waiting on the June 15th date, which has arrived, and it was really a, a big step and a, and a real turning point for uh, COVID related restrictions. So as of June 15th, the California Department of Public Health has removed pretty much all of the COVID related restrictions on business. Uh, so every, all the capacity social distancing requirements have been lifted for nearly all businesses and operations. So there are still some restrictions on, on what they're calling mega events. And so that's anything that's over 5,000 people indoors or over 10,000 people outdoors. And there's kind of a list of uh, um, some restrictions on, on events of those size. Um, but other than that, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty much wide open on our kind of trudge back to normal. Um, a lot of questions we get are with respect to mask wearing. So Masks are not required for fully vaccinated people, except in really some specific environments, which include public transit, healthcare settings, uh, schools, and a couple other locations. Um, and uh, 
I really want to point to the California Department of Public Health website. I really breezed over this pretty quickly, but they're they're kind of the governing body on this reopening plan. So for any additional information on these guidelines, the website is right there below the graphic, or you can just Google California Department of Public Health, and they're they're kind of the ones who are setting these these new guidelines as we as we reopen. Um, next slide. All right, so what all this means for the waterfront office and our operations. Um, good news, so as of Monday morning, we opened our doors at our public counter for in-person service. Uh, kudos to the front office staff there for getting everything in place and kind of getting, getting back to business in person. Uh, there are a couple new processes in place to continue to protect staff and any public or, or people who are unvaccinated. So there is limited capacity in our office and we've kind of set up a system to minimize crowding or, or people on the stairs. As, as you know, that area is pretty, pretty constricted as is. So staff has an intercom system and we kind of ask anybody to, to wait down below if there's already one or two people in the office. So just really trying to kind of be respectful and, and keep a minimal amount of, of traffic flow in there, but, but we are open and people have been coming in. So. And additionally, a few of the services that we suspended uh, in in person services, such as vessel measurements and dye tab testing of, of boat laboratories, those have those have also resumed, and those are those are mainly harbor patrol functions. Um, so, kind of a big week eas easing back in. It was nice to see people back in the office and kind of taking care of business in person. Um, the Kind of silver lining of the last year was that a lot of people found new ways to do business and, and we were one of them and so a lot of people are still enjoying the convenience of doing things online or over the phone and that's obviously still very av available but our, our doors are open um, during regular business hours next slide all right I'll, i wanted to touch a little bit on what this june 15th reopening means for all of our tenants and businesses down here so ultimately it's it's all good news. So restaurants, museums, retail, charters, wineries, really all of our tenants can open and operate at, at full capacity with, with pretty limited restrictions. So this is really a huge benefit to our tenants who can, who can really now resume business as usual. So I, I really do wanna take this time to kind of promote and welcome everyone to come back down here. It, it, there is, um, really signs of life again. The restaurants are seeing business and, and people are kind of getting getting back out. So the waterfront is and, and will be a, a great place to kind of enjoy all this. So, so come down and be sure to take any opportunity you have to sort of pass along that the, the waterfront's open for business. Our, our tenants are appreciated and, and, and we certainly do as well. Next slide, Angela. All right. So Additionally, I know most in this group are fairly eager to get back to in-person public meetings. So I know, I know city council and, and a lot of the other boards and commissions are pretty eager too, but we need to, as a city, we need to tackle some planning and preparation efforts. So really after over a year and a half of going virtual, that we need to do a little bit of work to ensure that meetings remain accessible to those who still have health concerns or unvaccinated folks who may want to still continue to attend meetings. Um, ultimately, it looks like council wants to lead the way on getting back to in person and they're they're shooting for July. I think there's a meeting around the July 20th, whatever Tuesday is around there. And they're shooting to do that in person in some form. It'll likely be a hybrid type meeting where council members meet in chambers, but public comment is still done virtually. So we'll, we'll see how that goes in July. And there's a potential for our, our next meeting in August to be in person. Um, a little reminder that our July meeting is canceled. Uh, we're, so our next meeting is, uh, is August. And um, yeah, we'll really keep tabs on council and see how they, how they do and see if it's something that we want to kind of wheel into by August. And if not, then, then definitely by September. Next slide, Angela. All right, more good news. So a quick plug and an update for this year's 4th of July celebration. So things are really all lining up for uh, kind of the classic fireworks show that we missed last year. 
So this year it'll be on Sunday, July 4th. We are under contract with Garden State Fireworks, who's the vendor who's provided the show in the past. So it'll be a 20 minute program, which is typical for previous years. And we really expect it to be similar to past years from a fireworks point of view, but we are gonna make some changes. We'll not be having any food vendors, not be having any live music or bleacher set, set up, just kind of in respect for the California Department of Public Health and the guidelines on what really would be considered a, a mega event. A mega event. We can expect a fair amount of, of people to come down. Um, as we still anticipate a fair amount of folks and pretty big crowds, we're going to ensure that all that all the other infrastructure is in place. So additional restrooms, trash receptacles. We are going to close Cabrillo Boulevard between State and Castillo and really have added support on hand from Harbor Patrol, Police Department and fire. So all of those sort of um, back of house services we're going to have in place because people are seeming that they want to get out and we anticipate there'll be a fair amount of people. So come watch from afar or, or come down. But as of now, it's looking like everything's pointing towards a uh, more conventional 4th of July. I'm kind of excited for it. Next slide. All right, I'll, I'll wrap up with a list of our tentative and upcoming topics for future meetings. So a reminder, we, we do not have a July meeting. Our next meeting will be August 19th. So some of the key items that'll come up in the August meeting. So the commission, you all will elect a new chair and vice chair. And at the August meeting as well, we'll do the subcommittee assignments and any, any shifting around there with, uh, with subcommittees. Um, additionally, we have a few items pending for either August or September, depending on, on timing. So I know this, the slip transfer policy subcommittee uh, owes the entire group an update or a presentation. And I, I know there'll be a brief update later in this meeting, but we'll, we'll still really owe the commission a complete pre presentation and that'll either come in August or September. Um, and a couple other updates to the commission, the East Beach mooring permit, permit um, muni code updates, and really a, a discussion on insurance requirements for vessels in the harbor. So I know I went through all that pretty quickly, but unless there are any questions, that's that's the end of my bit. I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Brian Bossy for his business services report. Unless there are any any questions on my part. All right, you're none. I'll Mr. Bossy over to you. Okay. Uh, good evening, Chair Sly and Commissioners. I wanted to let the Harvard community know about a wonderful upcoming training opportunity we have for waterfront tenants as well as their employees. We are lucky enough to be working with Yoli McGlinchey, the city's uh, emergency services manager to again put on a training entitled the Community Emergency Response Team Training or CERT training. And I say again, because the first time we did this, actually the only other time we did this was in the fall of 2018. And we thought it'd be a good idea to again um, three years later, conduct um, a similar training. So CERT, or the Community Emergency Response Team Program, was originally developed and implemented by the Los Angeles City Fire Department back in 1985. And it was such a successful program that in 1993, FEMA uh, made the training available nationally. And what CERT does is it provides a, a consistent uh, nationwide approach to volunteer training and organization for disasters. And usually wherever have, you have the training, it's particular that, that area and it's inherent disasters, Midwest, tornadoes, things like that. So out here, we last time we worked a lot with fires and um, earthquakes, tsunamis and things of that nature. Um, about, there are about 2,700 local CERT programs in the nation and more than 6, 600,000 individuals have been trained, I should say, about 615, because that's about how many people we had last time we did it. Next slide, please. So the CERT program uh, includes 24 hours of training. It's generally divided up into six separate days. We usually do mornings a certain day of the week uh, for six weeks in a row. Um, and again, Yoli McGlinchey comes down and leads this. And we have visitors from the fire department, the chief, the police, and all sorts of other folks involved as well as volunteers. 
So there's a number of categories or topic areas that uh, we go over, including disaster preparedness, and that is kind of overarching and tailored to our particular needs. Um, there's a fire protection section, which covers fire chemistry, hazardous materials, uh, fire hazards and fire suppression uh, strategies. We also uh, are given the opportunity to um, use a fire extinguisher, which you see them all over, but thankfully not many people get to use them and you'd think it's, you'd think it's easier than it is, but it's pretty difficult. Um, there is a process to that. So we get to do that with an actual fire, which is kind of fun. Uh, we also have uh, two steps, two different phases of medical operations. The first being diagnosing and treating airway obstructions and bleeding and shock uh, by using simple triage techniques. And the second component of the medical operations uh, conclude, includes doing head to toe assessments, establishing a, a medical treatment area, as well as rapid treatment techniques. So really informative. Um, we also do some light search and rescue operations, psychology and team organization. And then the last uh, session includes just the overall course review. And then we actually do a disaster simulation and you're broken up into teams and they throw it at you and it's pretty, pretty chaotic, uh, but a, a lot of fun. And then you sit down and you kind of review what happened. So great training opportunity. It is free and I encourage um, our, our tenants and their employees to please, if they want to take this class, uh, next slide, please. Please give me a call. Um, there's my number, 564-5525, or you can email me. Obviously you can call the front desk and they'll be routed to me as well. But again, wonderful, comprehensive, free training um, to provide to our, our tenants and as well as their employees. And if there's space after that, um, we can see about uh, letting other folks in. We also had a number of our employees take it last time, including myself, um, but great program. So I hope folks are interested and uh, we'll let you know the results after we go through the training. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you folks want to do it, you're more than welcome to do it as well. I should, I should also say. Is that a yes, Jim? Commissioner Sloan? <laughs> Maybe. Sounds interesting. I'm liking it. Yeah, so please, if you know anybody who spread the word, uh, we're happy to, to put them in the training. So that's all I have for tonight. Hello, hello. this is Brian Adair, and I'm thinking of a facilities management report. Next slide, please. I'd just like to update you on the uh, dredging funding for the federal channel, the United States President's fiscal year 2022 budget proposal recommends a $3.63 million budget to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Last year's budget for the federal dredging was $2.9 million. As you know, funds are vital to continue dredging Santa Barbara's federal channel to keep the harbor safe, safely operational. The Waterfront Department would like to thank Senator Alex Padilla, Senator Diane Feinstein, Congressman Salud Carbajal, County Board of Supervisors, City Council for their support in requesting continued federal funding. Next slide, please. The underground storage fuel tank, just an update, uh, has been substantially completed, but there are some punchless items that were still outstanding. One is that we kept the uh, alleyway closed between building 117 and 125 for pedestrian safety and for allow us time to do striping, traffic asphalt striping. That was completed today. And also the uh, stairs needs repairing on the west side of building 125. Uh, that repair has been delayed. So we're going to be opening up the alleyway this Monday uh, morning after the weekend. Any future plans regarding closing the alleyway for pedestrians only will require planning, design, and stakeholder input. So that's good. That's something that we're kicking around and uh, there'll be a long process to vet that and weigh the pros and cons. Next, uh, that's all. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, I guess 
What do you mean you're kicking around? Um, the, uh, as you probably are aware, Brian, uh, there was a, a bit of consternation and controversy associated with even the temporary closing of that alley, considering that it's essentially a primary access for the port and the commercial fishing industry. Um, so if there are plans for that, I guess, are you, are you planning to do any closure? Uh, that's an issue of real concern. Um, and I don't know if that you just are saying any future plans to suggest that there aren't any. Um, but in the event that there will be, uh, we'll seek stakeholder input. So what is, what's the status? Is, are there plans being kicked around or is at this time, no? There are no plans at this time, but if there is interest in the future to do so, we would like to open it up to the community and, and have lots of discussions about the pros and cons again. But again, right now, there is no plans. Uh, we are not going to invest any more time in that subject. We're going to open it back up to uh, vehicle traffic, commercial vehicle traffic only, and uh, try to minimize the traffic at the foot of the city pier. It's a really, as you know, it's a very congested area, and uh, we have to keep public safety in mind as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Commissioner Nelson, and, and thank, thanks, Brian. Just, just to add to that, we were really kind of forced into closing that, so it was, a, it was a nice little trial period. But there, there really is no long-term plans. It's just there were some. A number of stakeholders and some expressed real interest in in having that closed not not permanently but maybe on the weekends or something but a process like that takes permitting and review and subcommittee meetings and all, all sorts of stuff so that that's a process that we may engage in over the the, the months or year to come but it, it wouldn't be anything that would happen quickly or without without all parties getting to getting to weigh in I appreciate that, and uh, my, my only issue is you know very well uh, when a rumor, <laughs> when things get out, when there's when there's uh, a rumor that you're going to close the alley permanently, and uh, or you know make all the spaces down there for compact cars all only, there's going to be uh, a lot of interest in that. So, yeah, do sure you understand that? No, no, loud and loud and clear. And I'd like to take this time to kind of clarify that. And we've we've messaged that to the commercial fishermen and the people who use the city pier. So um, we were still very much in that project. And so I think we got a little uh, ahead of ourselves. And and somebody and there was some uh, maybe a bit of misinformation. But but really the 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 plan is to reopen that to vehicle traffic once the project is is complete. And that's going to be on. Monday for now, so it should be back open to status quo on as of Monday. Great news. Uh, this is Brian Adair. There is a next slide. I forgot. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just shows a, a very, very simple diagram. Uh, what I was trying to accomplish is that we have a lot of vehicle traffic, as you know, coming down Harbor Way. And then uh, again, we have a lot of congestion. So in today's striping, um, we try to create a roundabout so that a very visible roundabout so the majority of traffic we don't have business of loading delivering picking up commercial vehicles to the city pier or to the uh, to the tenants uh, we try to give them a, a clear path of travel and try to minimize traffic over by the city pier again uh, something that we've learned with the new configuration of the fuel tanks underground is that uh, there's very limited clearance for the uh, boat lift to get between the where the tanks sit and where the parking is. As you see in the diagram, it's labeled as compact parking. Those parking stalls as they sit are not big enough for regular vehicles and oversized vehicles. We have to make them compact because that's what the space is. But we also don't want large trucks and SUVs sticking out in the roadway where the boat lift can't get through unless he has to divert over the manhole covers or the fuel tank. Uh, so we try to find a balance there uh, to keep businesses flowing and tourists and guests have a, a close proximity to park. Any questions? 
Also, as you can see in the diagram, I created two uh, pedestrian walkways um, on the west side of the fish market. Um, there is just uh, there's a mix of pedestrian traffic with uh, vehicle traffic, and uh, that's one of them right there in the alleyway. Gives them a, a safe way to cross that alleyway. And then on the west side of the fish market, we created a, another walkway. We pushed the cars back four feet to create that walkway to separate pedestrian traffic from vehicle traffic. And that walkway is going to try to help people to educate them to be able to walk between the Coast Guard building and the waterfront center. That's a, a walkway that's very seldom used. People don't know about it. But as we try to look for a long-term master plan, uh, we'll try to improve parking spaces and flow, uh, pedestrian safety, but uh, that will be sometime down the road. After we have that master plan, we will reseal and restrike that area. <clears throat> That's uh, the end of my presentation, if there are no further questions. Good evening, sir. Hi, commissioners um, and members of the public. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Eric Ingebretson, and I'm the Harbor Operations Manager. And with that, I'll get started with our Harbor Operations Report. Next slide, please. So as reported in May, uh, we started back with uh, after a two year hiatus with our Harbor Clean Sweep. Um, our annual sweep floor cleanup event occurred May 16th and we had 40 volunteers, including uh, divers. Um, and we removed approximately two tons of debris from the seafloor. Uh, we focused this year on the commercial fishing areas um, and also along the accommodation dock uh, located just off of where the Harbor Patrol boats are. Uh, also, we included a West Beach cleanup. Uh, it was the first time we incorporated that and we had a great turnout for that and cleaned up West Beach as well. <coughs> So some of the items removed um, or some of the junk removed from this area. We had crab receivers, batteries, uh, fish cleaning stations, sea urchin baskets, galvanized pipes, steel cables, cell phones, uh, and a lot of other things up to and including even a kitchen sink. Uh, next slide, please. And also reported in May was our Harbor Watch program and our recap on that. Um, we did do a flare demonstration, which included a practical exercise. Uh, we had quite, quite the turnout this year. We had about 30 participants that attended. Um, and this was a practical uh, deployment of various types of handheld flares, projectile flares, parachute flares. Uh, it was conducted in a safe and controlled environment and did we have a video there, Angela? Um, and I'd like to give special thanks to Rick Hubbard and um, Chris Bell. Uh, Rick spends a lot of time organizing this and uh, Chris Bell almost sacrificed his drum in that video. Next slide, please. So the Santa Barbara to King Harbor race uh, after one year hiatus has returned. And uh, the race begins uh, July 30th at about noon, and it'll cover a distance of 81 miles. And it ends in King Harbor in Redondo Beach. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'd like, uh, like to give a big shout out to Sharon Green who uh, provided the photographs of the two sailboats in these last two slides. I um, really appreciate her photographs. Um, so uh, a warm welcome to the return of this event um, after this last year's during COVID. Next slide, please. So 
So I thought I'd throw in a, a little Harbor Patrol blotter for, for you folks uh, this evening um, and just kind of give you an update of some of the call volumes that we had at the end of May and early June. And as you can see here on May 24th, Harbor Patrol responded to a, an appliance that was smoking out on the shellfish company. We take these calls very seriously. We sent a patrol boat plus a vehicle to go out and investigate. Uh, this was a grease fire in the kitchen that had been extinguished by shellfish staff. And uh, so uh, everything turned out great um, for the better part, nothing like we had in 1998. On May 25th, Harbor Patrol responded to a traffic accident um, on Shoreline in Loma Alta. And this was a vehicle versus uh, bicyclist. And fortunately, um, we later learned that the bicyclist was okay. Um, there were some C-spine precautions taken, but ultimately the, uh, the bicyclist um, was okay. On May 25th, uh, uh, Harbor Patrol responded um, to the Breakwater restaurant after receiving a call that, um, from uh, an individual of a, a wanted subject um, who was wanted for assault. And uh, ultimately, that, that person was taken, uh, taken into custody and transported to county jail by the Santa Barbara Police Department. On May 28th, uh, we had an individual down at uh, Cabrillo and um, State Street challenging passerbys to fight. Uh, the individual was um, intoxicated and ultimately arrested for uh, public intoxication. And then on May 31st, uh, Harbor Patrol responded again to uh, State and Cabrillo with a subject with a gun. Uh, the police department and Harbor Patrol canvassed the area and no, uh, no gun or individual uh, matching the description was located. Um, on June 2nd, uh, we had one of our SoCal racers coming down from Monterey to Santa Barbara, 70 year old male fell from the vessel at Point Conception, was brought into Santa Barbara Harbor. Uh, he was mildly hypothermic um, and treated at the launch ramp by waiting paramedics um, from AMR. Uh, that was well, well handled and um, the communications between the vessel and Harbor Patrol and AMR were, um, were outstanding. And then the same day, June 2nd, uh, we had a wayward driver who, uh, out of state driver, who drove his vehicle out onto the breakwater uh, just south of Marina One, was located by a Harbor Patrol officer out taking photographs of the sunrise. And uh, Harbor Patrol assisted him, his vehicle backing back into the uh, Harbor Way, 130 Harbor Way, uh, and uh, got him to a parking spot so he could continue taking his, his photographs. And then last but not least, uh, the waterfront parking staff uh, down here at the harbor are really are our eyes and ears of the waterfront department. And we have some really alert staff that are working uh, with us. And they noticed an erratic driver, contacted Harbor Patrol, and ultimately that driver was arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence. Uh, special thanks to uh, the Waterfront Department, uh, Parking Department for doing such a great job and, and getting another drunk driver off the road. And that concludes my report. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Commissioner Nelson? No, I have none. Okay. Um, Eric? Betsy here. Mr. Kramer. Uh, yeah, hi. I, uh, thanks for the report. It's uh, you guys have been very busy, obviously. Um, I'm curious about the uh, photograph in the prior slide um, of the very, very high tide. Uh, yeah, that one. When was that taken? That one, I believe, was taken about three years ago during a, a storm. Um, and yeah, not recently. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, no. I, I, I thought I, maybe I missed something recently. Yeah, no. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Eric, I have a question. Um, do, do we have shark warnings 
posted last weekend? Uh, Commissioner Stedman, Chair uh, Sly, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is in the works. Um, I know Heal the Ocean was part of that and the Department of um, Fish and Wildlife Service. And they are pretty much just notifications on what you can and can't do with um, um, boating and going down into the areas where the sharks are and harassing the sharks. So more of an educational piece, um, but we do have those uh, notices are starting to get put up. Got it. All righty, well, great to see you all and hopefully we'll see you in person uh, come August. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to the staff for the, all those reports. I'm a little bit disappointed that the sea lion pup didn't make uh, any of these reports, but I guess we've all read about that by now somewhere. <laughs> um, any further questions anyone uh, wants to ask before we move on to the next item? Okay. Item six on the agenda is a presentation by the Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District. And uh, Mr. Wilshire, could you give us an introduction to that? Yeah, yeah, happily. No, um, I'd like to thank and introduce uh, Mr. Jim Fredrickson. So he's the Planning Division Supervisor with the uh, Air Pollution Control District. And so personally, we're, we're really happy to have Mr. Fredrickson. So we appreciate your your time and willingness to speak and put together a presentation on a topic that we're, I know the Harbor Commission and, and Waterfront staff are kind of really eager to hear about. So he'll be presenting today on kind of programs and grant opportunities and really requirements with respect to marine engines and the APCD. So um, Mr. Fred Fredrickson, thank, thank you. And I'll turn it over to you and, and Angela can advance the slides for you as you need. Perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you very okay. well. Uh, and, and just go ahead and call me Jim. <laughs> Mr. Fredrickson is my uh, deceased father. <laughs> so, uh, Perfect, thanks. Uh, yeah, good, thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, as uh, Mike introduced me, I'm Jim Fredrickson. Um, I've been with the Air District over 30 years. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before your commission this evening. Uh, we would like to develop an ongoing partnership with the Harbor Commission. So if this goes well tonight, Perhaps we can return annually to provide updates for you, how it, um, our grant programs can help benefit the harbor, how we can uh, work with the commercial uh, vessels in the harbor. So, and uh, thank you to Angela for all her organizational help. I, I needed some help there and she came through for me. So, um, uh, over the next 15 minutes, I plan to briefly cover who we are at the district, what we do, an overview of our grant incentive programs, and then specifically discuss grants for marine vessels along with the impacts of uh, state regulation upon the commercial vessels in the harbor. And feel free to interject questions at any time. I don't mind stopping to answer questions. There's about 10 slides. So um, most of these will go pretty quick, I hope. So uh, second slide, please, Angela. Thank you. Um, so the district is a public health agency that was created by law in 1970. So we're now over 50, 50 years old. Pictured is our main office in Santa Barbara called Casa Nueva, located on Cal Real between Turnpike and El Sueño. You can see us from the freeway usually when you drive by. Uh, we also have a secondary office in Santa Maria for staff that live and work in the North County. Our 13 member board of directors are comprised of the five county supervisors and a representative from each of the eight cities in the county. Each director also appoints two members to a community advisory council, which is a group of people with a wide range of perspectives that meet periodically to discuss technical issues related to our agency. The district has uh, four divisions, administration, engineering, compliance, and planning. Uh, we have 12 air quality monitoring stations located throughout the county that measure the quality of the air. We're required to develop plans to show how we're going to reach compliance with federal and state pollutant standards. Uh, we develop rules to achieve emission reductions from stationary sources, such as oil and gas companies. Uh, we don't regulate mobile sources of pollution, such as planes, trains, automobiles, automobiles, boats, that kind of thing. Uh, stationary sources that pollute are required to get a permit to operate from us, and they must comply with that permit. Uh, we calculate actual emissions from the permitted sources and we assess fees based on how much they pollute. 
Our agency is primarily funded through the sources we regulate. Uh, we review land use projects for air pollution impacts and we seek to minimize them. We work with businesses and local communities to leverage money into emission reductions from sources that we don't regulate, such as on-road motor vehicles, off-road equipment, marine vessels, that kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, we send out public information via our website and social media. We have an education program that works with elementary, high school, and colleges. We've installed low cost air pollution low cost air pollution sensors throughout the county. Uh, we're a, and we're also we're a partner in a successful statewide vessel speed reduction program called Blue Whales Blue Skies, and it reduces pollution from container ships that go through the channel, and it protects marine mammals. And it, the program um, operates by providing financial incentives and positive publicity to the companies who reduce the speed of their fleets. So perhaps you've heard of that. That's been around since about, um, about seven years now. Uh, third slide, please. Excuse me, Jim. Yeah, sure. On on uh, that program where you're slowing down the shipping traffic. Yes. Is that the program where you're making payments to those companies who slow down their speed? Yeah, they, the companies, um, they will... Basically, they will sign up for the program each each year. We open it up. I, I believe it opened up in May, and it runs um, basically throughout the summer into the fall. And then, and then they register their fleets with us, and then that the fleet information is tracked using AIS, and and the speeds are recorded, and and determining and it's determined how well they they operated as a fleet during that that time period, and then they are given. Uh, basically, they're kind of ranked by tiers, you know, sapphire rank is like the highest, you know, then there's like, you know, gold, silver, that kind of thing. And so the, 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 the better they do, the, they do receive financial incentives. And then, and then those, um, then there are also awards given out. And then these awards are publicized throughout their industry. And there are um, a number of, you know, trade magazines and, and, and actually the financial incentives are not huge. Um, compared to, you know, what you would think. I mean, I think they're getting, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars, but the publicity is really what is um, huge for them because then they can market themselves as a, you know, co environmentally conscious uh, operation and they can, um, you know, they can benefit from that financially. So um, it's proven to be, it's a, it's an interesting carrot that we put out there. I mean, we're actually working with Ventura County and now we're working uh, with, with the Bay Area and uh, we work with uh, NOAA. And, and so um, it, it's, uh, you know, this collaboration of, of local and state and federal government, but these, um, these companies are really attracted to this program. It's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, process to watch. It's, it's a lot of it. Information is on our. We just had a board presentation in May, and we have a presentation on our our, our website. Um, if you just search for VSR, you could find a lot of the information there. Or I'm happy to to forward information to Angela, and she could get it to you as well. Thanks. Thanks for the update. Yeah. Where did that program initially start? Whose brainchild was it? Um. It started, I believe it was just a collaboration between Santa Barbara and Ventura Air Districts initially. And um, Bay Area ended up doing, I think they ended up doing their own program and then we ended up partnering with them. And, and we're also working with the South Coast Air District down in the Port of LA, Port of Long Beach. Cause I mean, it, essentially the, <laughs> the whole coast of California is, is interconnected, right? I mean, you, you, those coastal waters, I mean, they, they leave the Port of LA and, Long Beach and pretty soon they're in the Santa Barbara Channel. You leave the Santa Barbara Channel, it isn't long before you start reaching Bay Area waters. And and so, I mean, I think ultimately the goal is probably to have just like this speed zone along the entire state uh, where they're traveling. I mean, basically, you know, they come in either the Bay Area or they come in right there, right there, Point of Guayo. And, um, and so, um, it's it's a collaboration. It, it started, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I said about seven seven years ago, I believe. So um, uh, I'm pretty sure that we were. Uh, I wasn't involved with it initially, so um, I think it was our 
part of our initiative to get that going. Yeah, it's my understanding that this, the Sanctuary Advisory Council is where those ideas first came out and they're starting to talk about the ship strikes and oh yeah, and kind of started to talk about the um, additional pollution benefits of slowing the ships down as they pass through the channel. Yeah, well, let, let's give them credit. They're, they're good, good folks. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's uh, Sean Hastings we work with at, at, uh, at the Marine Sanctuary. Um, along with a lot of other people in their in their group. So yeah, so the, reducing the speeds uh, reduces a lot of the fatalities. So maybe the whales still get hit, but since the ships are going slower, they're not fatal blows. Uh, and, the, and the whales will be able to, to live that collision. So, um, and there's significant uh, pollution reductions by, by just slowing down from, um, whatever they were going down to like say 12 knots or 10 knots, that kind of thing. So um, I, I, and it's actually grown every year we've done it. it uh, more, more and more fleets are joining. Um, it's becoming more and more popular. So, um, and, and, and we're trying to, I mean, we're, it's basically cobbled together with a lot of state and local or mostly local money. And so the goal is just, we've been trying to get federal money to, to kind of back this and, um, because that's the hard part is, is getting the incentives, the financial incentives in place, so. Okay, so we're on slide three, uh, grant program. So over the past 33 years, the district has leveraged approximately $48 million in state and local funds to implement numerous emission reduction projects throughout the county. Currently, these are the six categories of our grant program. So on-road trucks and buses, off-road equipment, marine engines, school buses, ag engines, and infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. On our incentive programs, uh, since 2006, we have used over $7 million to scrap over 6,000 dirty vehicles. Currently, we pay $1,000 to owners to scrap their 1997 or older model vehicle. Uh, the LEAF program has now operated over two years, and it's very popular. We provide 60% of the cost towards the purchase of new electric landscape equipment and, and additional funds to scrap old gasoline equipment. The program serves commercial businesses, nonprofits, and public agencies. Uh, next slide. Several years ago, the California Air Resources Board, and I'll call them CARB from now on, uh, began to uh, focus on disadvantaged and low-income communities and created the Com Community Air Protection Program based on Assembly Bill, Assembly Bill 617. Community air protection funds are provided by CARB to air districts and need to be expended on emission reduction projects located within these disadvantaged and low-income communities. So the light blue areas on the map are the low-income communities in Santa Barbara County. Um, you know, the, the big portion on the left on the map, that's Los Padres National Forest. So there's not a whole lot of uh, population there, but uh, it does cover Cuyama and the far north. Uh, most of Santa Maria, all of Guadalupe, down to Casmalia, Vandenberg Air Force Base. There's a little bit Southern Lompoc, um, Isla Vista, some in, in Nolita, and then uh, a little bit in Carpinteria and the city of Santa Barbara. And, and I, I threw in the city of Santa Barbara so you can see that on the right, which includes also the harbor is considered part of that low income community. Uh, next slide, please. So historically, we started repowering marine vessels in the harbor dating back to at least 1993. And during this time, we have used over $4.1 million to repower 127 engines on 95 different vessels. Most of the main and auxiliary repowers were on commercial fishing vessels. Uh, the recent photos show a sampling of the vessels and, and the new engines. It's ironic, I think the next item on the agenda is uh, little two, and there's a picture of it. Um, so uh, hello to Captain Fred when if he gets on the line. Um, so uh, with the newer, more efficient engines, uh, the vessel owner commonly experiences fuel savings, uh, sometimes significant fuel savings, and besides uh, reducing the toxic exhaust while they're idling or during operation. So perhaps you've, you've been in the harbor uh, when, you know, the, the commercial fishermen are started up their engine and there's, a, you know, a, a cloud. Um, these new, newer engines, they eliminate the clouds. So um, very nice. Uh, for our 2021 Clean Air Grant Program, which is set to launch on August 2nd, so about a month and a half from now, 
Uh, eligible projects may receive a grant within a range from $10,000 to $250,000 and not to exceed 80% of the project's total eligible costs. So if it's $100,000, we can pay up to $80,000. Uh, emission reductions from the project must be surplus any rule or regulation. So if someone's required, it's, it's a voluntary program. So if someone's required to do something, we can't fund it, but if it's voluntary, we can. Uh, priority will be given to zero emission or near zero emission technology projects and projects located in low income communities, such as the Harbor. And uh, as we sh showed on the map, um, next slide. Our program is open to commercial vessels with diesel engines. It, it excludes commercial vessels with gasoline engines and it also excludes recreational vessels. Uh, that, that's, those are state requirements. Um, we limit our program only to vessels based in Santa Barbara County not, not say out of Ventura Harbor. So they need to be in Santa Barbara Harbor, essentially. Uh, however, they may operate in Tri-County waters, uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Ventura. Uh, one of the major application requirements is to provide fuel records and usage based on the hour meter from the previous two years. And this is generally um, an area that, that commercial uh, owners struggle with. So it's important that they, you know, keep records and they track this. And, and if they're thinking about applying for a grant, they want to do that in advance. And they want to start, you know, recording that information. The, the fuel records are usually pretty easy. They can get that from the fuel doc. And, the, and those folks are generally, you know, will print off their fuel records. So, um, but anyway, so that's important. And then uh, all, additional information is on our uh, Marine program website. And the link is, is there in the presentation. Uh, next slide. So this is a summary of the grant agreement process that each successful grantee is required to follow. I've highlighted that each marine app engine applicant must also provide a current CARB commercial harbor craft report. Um, that's unique to the marine grants. As part of our application re review, we inspect the existing marine engines. We develop and execute a grant agreement, which is similar to a contract then the vessel owner may begin the process to order, install, and purchase the new engines. Once that's complete, the district inspects the new engines, we verify destruction of the old engines, and then process the payment of the grant funds to the grantee. This is a reimbursement process, and that usually confuses people. We, we will set up a contract in advance. Once everything's done and paid for, we reimburse the grantee. And lastly, the grantee must annually report their usage for the term of the grant agreement Generally, these, these run about three years on average, and then um, they may be subject to a, an audit inspection. Those are kind of random and um, infrequent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the near future, CARB's commercial harbor craft proposed regulation amendments will impact marine vessels with diesel engines in the harbor. Um, I'm going to do my best to present CARB's information. This is their regulation, not Santa Barbara's. <laughs> um, this is a complicated table. And um, after I sent it to Angela, I probably could have cleaned it up and made it a little, little easier to understand. But um, I highly recommend if people are interested in the, in the regulation that they visit the website below. You can also su subscribe to their email listserv and get the latest information. So. Um, the regulation was originally adopted in 2007. It was amended in 2010 and will be fully implemented by the end of 20, 2022. So um, just about a year and a half from now. CARB is currently developing, developing additional amendments to the Harbourcraft regulation. And I'll mention the current schedule in just a moment. So let's try to walk through this table together. The, the compliance dates for vessels on, on the far right, they, de they vary depending on the vessel type which is in the first column, the engine tier, which is in the second column, and then the engine model year. Those are the three key factors, the vessel type, the engine tier, the, the, the year of the, of the engine, existing engine. Okay, so column one shows the vessel types. Not all these might be in the Santa Barbara Harbor. Um, I know we, we know there's plenty of commercial fishing now, that, so that's, that's the main focus here. Um, column two shows the engine tier. So, the tier of the engines are established by US EPA. Uh, in general, a tier zero engines were manufactured be before 2004, and those are considered uncontrolled. So they have no controls on them. And those are the dirtiest engines. And those are generally the target of all of our programs is to, is to eliminate the uncontrolled engines, the tier zeros. And at this point, uh, especially for like commercial fishing, 
they are not required to ever replace the tier zero engine. And, you know, essentially when they do, they have to go to a tier two or newer engine, which is, I'm getting out of myself. I'm sorry. Let me back up. <laughs> um, okay, so tier one engines. Uh, let, let's, let's go there. Tier one engines are manufactured in 2004 and they meet the tier one standard of emission control. They're cleaner than un uncontrolled. The tier two engines manufactured in the 2005 to 2007 range, they're cleaner than tier one. And then tier three engines manufactured uh, 2009 to 2014, those are cleaner than tier two. The tier four engines, they started making those in 2014. Those are the cleanest diesel engines available, but they're currently only available for over 800 horsepower. So they're not really applicable to vessels in the Santa Barbara Harbor, to my knowledge. Um, those are very large vessels that have those engines. Um, so the main goal of this amended regulation is to accelerate the replacement of the uncontrolled in the tier one engines. As you can see in those, the first two rows, the all marine vessels and then the commercial fishing only, it, it's focused on the tier zero and the tier one engines. So um, let, let's let's go with the, the all marine vessel. So that's, that's everything except commercial fishing. So that's gonna be what you see below, the ferries, the pilot, the tug, the tow, commercial charter fishing, research excursion, off work boat, all of those are considered um, in line one. So if they have a tier zero, an uncontrolled engine or a tier one, if that currently is, is going on right now, they're gonna have to replace that engine somewhere between 2023 to 2025, depending on the, the, the model year of that engine. So if it's, if it's a little, let's see, I have it right here. Um, if it's 1993 or older, they have to, they'll have to comply by 2023. 1994 to 2001, it's 2024, 2000, um, 2002, 2006, then it's 2025. So depending on if, you know, if it's a really old engine, it's gonna have to meet that 2023 deadline, which is coming up really fast. That's not very much time for people to respond to this. Um, generally CARBs regulations have some, you know, usually a few years of lead time to comply. So this is a really short compliance time for that. Um, the commercial fishing is different. They, th that is essentially almost like 40% of the statewide fleet is commercial fishing vessels. So they're giving more time for commercial fishing. If they have a tier zero or tier one engine, they have to go to a tier two or newer. So, so you can see uh, that all marine vessels have to go to a tier three or tier four um, which is probably not likely, at least a tier three. Tier threes are readily available. But if you're commercial fishing, you can still get by with a tier two engine. Manufacturers do not make those anymore, but they are still out on the, on the secondary market. And they get that additional time. They get out to 2030 to 2032. So um, that's another one of those things where if they, um, the older the engine, they're going to be closer to the 2030. If it's relatively newer, it's the 2032. So let me stop right there. There's a lot of information. Is there any questions on that so far? Yeah, I have a question. The DPF diesel particulate uh, mm -hmm. filter thing, is that a tier three engine only or is it would a tier four? Yeah. Available. Good question. That's a tier. It's only on tier fours. To make the tier four technology work, it has to have the DPF, and and that's so, pretty common with um, tier four off-road engines, <clears throat> uh, that kind of thing. They, they usually have the DPF as part of that, or or some kind of a diesel uh, emission reduction fluid. So then, compliance could be achieved with a tier three engine alone. Yes. Uh, for these vessels. Yeah. Uh, and tier tier three would be cheaper than a tier four also. Um, but as I was saying before, it's gonna, it, for right now, tier fours are generally not available unless it's a, you know, a very large engine. And we, I think the, the biggest engines that we've done in our program are the Condor Express and the Danny C. And I think those are, no bigger than 500 horsepower, you know? So you, so I think the biggest or the smallest tier four engines available are, are 800. So um, I, you know, it's, it's, like I said, I don't think it applies to anything in Santa Barbara Harbor, probably never will, I, I would think. 
Um, I, I, I mean, a, an 800 horsepower engine, you know, fills a room. So, um, okay. Uh, well, if there's no other questions, let me let me skip down. The um, the following dates aren't listed on the slide, and I, I didn't get a chance to put in there. So, these are the next steps for the regulation. Uh, the State Department of Finance is going to release a regulation impact assessment. So they're going to—they're basically basically doing a financial analysis of how much this regulation is going to cost the industry. That's going to be released in August, uh, and then uh, CARB plans to release an official 45-day comment period on this uh, regulation on October 1st, and then CARB plans to hold a public hearing on November 18th, and that's open to the public. And that that'll all of that will be noticed. If you sign up for that email list, you'll you'll be getting all these notifications. So, um, like I said, this is all happening pretty fast, and so that's one of the reasons I wanted to get in, in front of you, so that you can at least be aware of this and and perhaps pass this information on to the people that it will be affected by it. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, does does CARB have a current list of the commercial vessels that are currently tier zero and tier one, or how how would they uh, how would they know? Yeah, they they um, yeah they have all that information. Well, I, let me back up. They they have it, all the information that's been reported to them. Uh, I'm there's possibly people that um, try not to be not to report, but they. Essentially, everyone, a commercial uh, vessel, all of them were required to submit a commercial hovercraft at least one time. So, um, and I've been told by CARB, not um, just the, the people that work in the, you know, the grants realm, that, you know, CARB has a, a very robust compliance division. Um, it's not huge, but they are very effective and, and they will, um, you know they'll they'll go to harbors and then they'll I get maybe rant and maybe they're looking for certain vessels I don't know and maybe they'll see something and it's not on their list and I guess the fines are pretty steep if you try to evade uh, compliance with their <laughs> with their regulations so um, <clears throat> whenever I'm talking with commercial fishermen you know well one of the requirements of our program as I mentioned you have to submit this report that means you have to have yeah. provided this to CARB CARB, CARB has the list of, of all the vessels in the state and they have them by, you know, by model year, engine, you know, they have, they have usage, they have um, pretty much all they need to do these kind of a regulation. Okay, great, thanks. And I apologize for my background. I wish I had the background that Mike Nelson had. That's really, um, that's pretty nice there. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, Angela, next slide, please. This is basically um, my last kind of technical slide. Um, so we, here we can really use your help. This is the biggest challenge of our grant programs is getting the word out to people who could benefit the most. Uh, we currently have over 1,100 people on an outreach email list, but we want to. We always continue to expand that list. Um, we tend to get. It's funny. We get about one person a day asking to be added to the list. So that that is growing, but. Um, we still struggle with outreach. It's just um, some people don't even know who our agency is and we've been around for 50 years. So it's just one of those things. Um, fortunately, I did connect with, with Mike uh, Wilshire this afternoon. Uh, he informed me that Eric uh, Engelbretson is the new Harbor Operations Manager. So we will plan to connect with Eric in the near future to help us um, get out the information on our 2021 program to the, to the uh, Harbor email list. We, have, we did work with Mick Bronman in the past and he told me that, you know, I got this, you know, email list of everybody, all the vessel owners, and, and he forwarded our announcement. So it, it's not going to be much, though. We don't, we only put out a couple emails. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, so. Um, wait, wait, Jim. Yeah. Are, are you saying that Mick Cronman, Cronman has a private email list? Oops. Did I just did I just mess something up? <laughs> no, you didn't mess anything up. I'm just wondering why. <laughs> Is Mike and Eric and Eric, are they still on the line here? <laughs> uh, well, I I had I had just been down in the harbor and I went to the harbor master's office and I and I said, look, we got this program and I brought like a flyer and I said, you know, we're we're 
we're posting these flyers at the marina entrance and that's on the slide here that's the picture of last year's flyer and people do see those and um i asked if, if there's any way to help you know spread the word because i mean i mean yeah we could put it at the marina entrance but um you know i don't know if people are actually seeing those i mean there's all kinds of stuff you know people selling boats and you know all kinds of things and uh so he said yeah i have a i have an email list i i'm sorry mike if i got if i'm getting or eric i'm getting in trouble here but um yeah so he, i don't i don't know what the list is but he said he had some kind of a list of of the, the vessel owners and and i just sent him our material and he said he'd forward it on so um that's all i know and that's all i'm going to confess to now <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> And okay. and that, that's fine. I, th I think he's just referring to our listserv list of commercial fishermen and our tenants who operate commercial vessels. And so we, we do have emails for those those folks and slip holders. Oh, okay. okay. Good. Yeah. All right. I, I thought, you know, like you had to go to Mick to get, you know, the broadcast list or something he'd been building for years and years. It's like, why don't we just get it from him, right? No, so, no. This is a waterfront list, but Mick's, Mick's no longer... Uh, um, Harbor Ops manager, so no, this isn't his his personal list. It's our our waterfront list. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, that that sounds legit. <laughs> okay, yeah, that does. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that, that's kind of this dilemma we're in. We're you know we're trying to get the word out. How do we do this? Um, uh, and you know, it's interesting that that Mike Nelson's here on the commission. Um, you know, we we back in I think it's 2019 uh we met with Mike Nelson and Chris Voss with the commercial fishermen group of Santa Barbara uh, had a good dialogue uh, we've been unable to connect since then but we'd really like to reestablish that relationship and hopefully have more dialogue in the near future and well, last, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mike. last year uh a member of your staff is giving us the flyers and the, and we distribute it to our okay our, our listserv so for the last two years uh, we have made our membership and our interested parties list. Um, they, they all get copies of those flyers. Oh, good. Okay. Because we tried, we tried, as you recall, I guess it was in 2019 to actually schedule a public meeting of sorts that we right. couldn't make happen. So. Yeah, that that is hard to coordinate. That maybe you know with uh, Zoom technology and that kind of thing, we could maybe easier for. Uh, the commercial fisher group to to access that kind of thing instead of trying to actually arrive at some conference room or something at seven o'clock or something at, you know whatever that is um, we, we we're we're totally available to you know make something work um, and and I think that would be important too because it they generally have some technical questions that maybe is maybe there's misconceptions about the application process or or um, you know some of the nuts and bolts about the program, and that we can clear up, you know, with the dialogue. So um, it seems like a, a lot of our success in the harbor has been by word of mouth. But th those folks talk to each other. So and so got some new engines, and so and so, and somebody else goes, "Hey, what? You know, where would you get those? Where would you get the money for that?" And I think, "Oh, I got it from the, you know, the air district," and and uh, and. It's like I said, it's interesting how people, some people never even heard of us. And um, so we're doing our best to, um, you know, and I, the Harbor Commission is a perfect, you know, avenue for us to like, here we are. <laughs> because a lot of the money we get is use it or lose it too. So we need, you know, the state gives us money and if we don't spend it, we got to give it back to them. So, you know, we eagerly, and you know, we have deadlines to actually expend it. And so we really want to move the money. And um, so the, the more, people that we can get to apply the better for us and, and Jim I you may find it ironic but the reason uh, the, the request was made to you to perhaps do a presentation here came from uh, the charter boat industry and I think it was Jamie Diamond I don't know oh, if she's yeah. on the call but she she's the one that had questions about the procedures, the reimbursements and that sort of thing I don't know if you've had a conversation with her yes. or she's in the audience but it wasn't she had a question so yeah she actually attended um not too long ago one of our board meetings and had a public comment and so i reached out to her my our director asked me to reach her reach out to her directly so i did speak with her and we had um 
at least a couple conversations over the phone and some emails and and answered questions and uh, we've we've done some projects with with their vessel um, at least two projects with their vessel maybe three um, and so um, yeah so that so that's interesting I didn't I did not know that but I, I have spoke with her and and I think at this point all of her questions have been answered so um, but the day I mean, you know, as part of that regulation, they're a, you know, considered a commercial charter fishing or, or, you know, excursion. They, I've talked to the Air Resources Board, and actually, when people submit these car commercial harbor craft reports, it's actually on the vessel owner's honor to state what type of vessel they are, and and CARB doesn't necessarily go back and, you know verify i mean if somebody said well yeah i'm a commercial fisherman but maybe they're doing charter fishing and maybe they're doing excursion but if they say they're a commercial fishing vessel then they actually have a different compliance schedule so um and maybe i shouldn't have just spoken about that publicly on a recorded video but um that's the way it is um so um so the, so those folks i mean if you look at that regulation timeline if you're commercial fishing um, well, Angela, can you just go back, um, just like, I think it's, uh, one slide. Um, so, so they're the commercial charter fishing slash research slash excursion. So they got, they're looking at, uh, 2026 to 2030. Uh, oh wait, no, no, I'm sorry. Well, it depends if they're tier two or tier zero or tier, tier one, I guess it depends on their engines. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, if you're commercial fishing in your tier zero, you're, you got seven more years to comply than if you are a tier zero with a commercial charter fishing. You know, you're so Jamie Diamond may need to change out their engines. I, I think their engines are already. I mean, we've actually. I think uh, I'm pretty sure there are at least tier two engines in there. But um, still, they they have they're on a shorter time window, and that that that's a challenge for some of these companies. To have to comply with this regulation in just a you know just a couple of years um, or a few years, it, you know it's expensive to change out those engines. So and once once a company is essentially required by this regulation to, I mean basically only the years before this compliance deadline starts. So if somebody is required by 2023 to to change out their engines. We can only do a grant up to 2023. So, I mean, we could do, if we did a grant today, we could, it would, you know, it's a year and a half grant. Um, generally, it may not be cost effective to, for us to be able to do that. So, I mean, it, the, the grant opportunities shrink for these people um, as that, that, that time frame comes upon them. So that's why we try to get these voluntary programs out early People can do these. If it's all voluntary, they're doing it in advance. We can give them grant funds as soon as they're required to change out their engines. Then we can't do it, and uh, and then they have to they carry the full brunt of the cost. Not sure if that made sense or not. Okay. Well, I guess um, Angela, we can go to the last slide. Uh, it's just my contact information. Um, so my information, along with Desmond Ho, he's uh, one of my staff members that oversees our Marine Engine Grant Program. Uh, if anybody wants to join our outreach contact list, here's the email address. Um, we plan to send out an email in early July to raise awareness of our August 2nd launch. So we're gonna send like a, a one month reminder to the list. And then we'll follow up with an email in mid-July about a two week advance warning. That will have links to our updated web pages and the application forms. So people will be able to access the application in advance, two, week in, two weeks in advance, approximately. Uh, the applications are fillable PDFs, so people can, can fill them out online. They can save them and email them to us, or they can print them and fill them out. They can mail them to us. They can drop them off at our office. We also have a, uh, an online Google form that people can use as well, so you don't actually have to deal with a PDF, you can just fill in the blanks on this Google form and hit submit and it comes to us. And so that's kind of how that works. Um, thank you for your time and attention. I'm, I'm happy to answer any more questions that you may have at this point. 
Uh, I have a, a comment here. This, there's a an interesting nexus with respect to this program and the program that um, slows the ships down in the channel. And that as a member of the sanctuary, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council, um, I was one of the first to bring into the conversation the, Mac, the fact that there was a considerable fuel savings involved. And that, I only knew that because I was one of the first grantees of this program when, back when uh, Peter Cannell was mm -hmm. uh, at the APCD. And I discovered that by pulling the throttles back on my engines by just a little bit, now these engines were more efficient in the first place, but by just a little bit and cutting back from 12 knots to only 10 knots, it burned about half or a little less than half the fuel. And that was a uh, result of the speed reduction. And so for every gallon of fuel I saved, you can just assume that I saved at least that amount, amount of of pollutants from going into the atmosphere. And that's kind of how it started. And the other point I want to make is that our charter fishing fleet throughout the entire state is really between a rock and a hard spot right now because of those um, incoming carb requirements and the timeline with respect to these grants. There's another grant type, I think it may be the same or not, called the Car Carl Moyer grant. Yeah, that, it's the same thing. Okay. so. The grant period, from what I understand from you, is it needs to be able to run for enough time before they're required to re-engine anyway that the pollution savings make it cost effective to put their engines in. Yes. And yeah, that's, can... that's three years and this requirement could potentially go in in less, less than that. And there's a certain amount of time that goes into applying and getting approved and so forth. So this is a really, really challenging time for them right now. Yes, I highly agree. Um, one comment on the Marine Sanctuary. Uh, I did work with, we had a, a colleague at, our, at the Air District named Mary Bird. I, I think she's a, she's on the Marine Sanctuary um, or maybe she's a alternate on your, on your group. And she was actually involved with the, the Vessel Speed Reduction Program also. Um, yeah, I did. And, did work with Peter Cannell for a long time. Um, yeah, so the the way that the the grant calculation works, uh, it's a cost effectiveness. So the state sets a a, a limit. It's actually thirty thousand dollars a ton, but it, it does the number isn't really important. But it, that limit, and so what we do is we will look at the minimum contract we were going to do is a year, and. And if we do a, if say someone needs to comply and maybe, maybe it's uh, 2023, like that first deadline. Okay, so that's a year and a half from now. Let's say this program opens up in August and they apply, we accept their project. We do a contract this fall and they go ahead and order the engines. Maybe they can get it installed before, you know, January one. And so we can get in, you know, maybe we can get in uh, two years of, of the of that project before they get have to comply. So that's a two year project. Um, that we're gonna we're gonna do this calculation and it's gonna determine how much and, and depending on how old that engine is, how dirty it is, how much they operate it. I mean, there are some some commercial fishermen that that run a lot of a lot of fuel. I mean, they, I mean, whatever, eight thousand gallons, ten thousand gallons a year. I don't know, whatever. Um, and so, so the usage is also a key component of this. If they don't operate it much, the emissions aren't going to be much. So, so we're looking at the total emissions over that time frame, and and so we'll do that calculation. So it has to be cost effective, and then based on that, it, it'll determine how much we can actually give them as a grant. So it's possible maybe it's not enough incentive for them to move forward with it, but let's say it is. But we got to get enough time in before that deadline kicks in. So maybe they can only do a two year grant. I mean, right now, that's actually the most we're gonna be able to do for some of those people that have to comply by 2023. Maybe we can't even get two years in. If it if it rolls into, you know, February, by the time we can actually, you know, execute this project, maybe we can only really technically get a year in and then it may not be cost effective at all. So, I mean, it's really important for 
those people that have those tier zero, tier one engines. Um, Angela, if you're willing to go back two more slides, let's just have that table up again because I don't have it in front of me. Thank you. So that that top line, um, if they have a tier zero, tier one engine, that that 2023 deadline is is going to um, those people are are in a tight spot. So that's the you know commercial charter fishing, the excursion. I know those vessels are in the harbor. You know if they have a tier zero, tier one. I don't know how many of those are out there, the tier zero, tier ones. Maybe there's not that many. Um, we don't have a, a database of the, you know, the, the, the craft in the harbor. The state does, but um, they don't necessarily give that information out to us. So um, perhaps you, you know, maybe that's something that you guys collect. I'm not really sure, but I, I'm totally willing to. Uh, work with with that industry if you guys want to. I mean, maybe I can work with Mike and Eric. I don't know how, how you guys want to do this, but but um, you know, if we want to reach out specifically to that group that is is under these timelines, um, I'm you know we're willing to to meet and 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 try to do some. We can even do some preliminary you know calculations and try to figure out what people could potentially qualify for. Um, we don't necessarily advertise that, but I mean, it's something we're willing to do to help people out. So, um, I mean, I mean, this is, think of it this way. I mean, this is a state regulation. Here's the local people that are affected by it. We're kind of in between, we, you know, we're, we're in the process of helping the local community out with, you know, by using these state funds. So um, we're not regulating them. We have no con control over the marine vessels, but we're here to help. So anything we can do to help these people, um, we're willing to do, so. Any, any last questions? I've silenced the crowd. <laughs> yeah. I, think you, I think you answered everybody's questions. I sucked well, the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> uh, Jim, thank you very much for taking uh, taking your time this evening to make that presentation. That's good. Yeah. My, my pleasure. Yeah. And like I said, uh, we can come back another time. Um, it doesn't have to. I mean, it could be any time, really. I mean, if you want to put us on the agenda, we, we're happy to to uh, to talk again as we you know as we reach these these timelines and. Um, we're not, not sure, or if, or if there's another group you want us to be involved with, please let us know. Um, do that like it, Mike, if you want to, you know, if we can, if the commercial fishing group wants to, uh, you know, get together. I'm not sure if they, if that includes the, if charter fishing people are in there, excursion people are in there, but, um, <clears throat> you know, we're happy to, to uh, make ourselves available at any point. Okay. I just want to say from the waterfront point of view, thanks, thanks, Jim, and all, all work with you and, and Eric, and, and I'm glad we made this connection. And, and certainly we can touch base on a future agenda, but we'll, we'll work with you in the interim as well with any of our tenants or any vessels in the harbor here. So this is, this is a good, a good, good connection. So thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. That sounds great. I appreciate all your time. Hope you have a good evening, and uh, hopefully we'll talk down the road. Thanks, Jim. Good. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks and good night. All right, bye. <clears throat> uh, the last, the last four uh, numbered items on our agenda are uh, seven, eight, nine, and ten are new leases extending the term of existing uh, performing uh, tenants who are who are well known to us. Uh, they're all small leases. And I'm going to suggest that we ask staff to go through all four of these together. And if anyone wants to pull a, put one of these leases out and vote on it separately for any reason, we can do that. Uh, if there's nothing uh, uh, that indicates otherwise, um, we, could, we, we can try to just do one voice vote uh, uh, on these instead of doing four different voice votes. So if that's acceptable to everybody, we'll see if we can uh, do that, make it a little more efficient. Uh, they are they are tenants that are well known to us. So staff, can uh, uh, Mr. Bossy, is that your your job to roll through these? That it is. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, as you just stated, we have a nice little lineup of two license agreements and two leases. So I will get moving. First up 
is uh, a proposed license agreement with Epic Cruises Inc. for Little Toot. Um, Kat, Fred and Kathy Hirschman have operated the Santa Barbara Water Taxi, also known as Little Toot, under license under various license agreements since October of 2003. Since that time, Little Toot has carried over 1 million passengers and provides a valuable service to both visitors and the boating community. Little Toot currently charters uh, $5 per adult for a one-way trip and $2 for children 12 and under. Next slide, please. The proposed, I should say license terms, my bad. The proposed license terms, uh, one five-year term, initial term with one five-year option. The base rent is proposed to be $100 per month. Again, I mentioned in the last slide, this is a more of a service. This is not uh, by any stretch a, a very profitable uh, endeavor on the Hirschman's part. It is a service to the community and they also pay a percentage, percentage rent. So they do either or, they are always in percentage rent, obviously with something that low. And they also have a cost of living increases based on the consumer price index. The Hirschmans are considered a tenant good standing by the department. As you know, they just were successful in a request for proposal process for uh, office space. Next, license, please. Batting second tonight. All right, here we go. Uh, again, uh, another license agreement with Epic Cruises Inc. Uh, for their work with Azure Seas and Whisper. Uh, Epic Cruises, again, family owned by the Hirschmans, is a local business that has been part of the waterfront community for uh, nearly two decades. Again, going back to 2003. Owners Fred and Kathy Hirschman were selected uh, through a competitive request for proposal process to operate a luxury passenger yacht service based off of Stearns Wharf in 2011. The 70-foot luxury vessel Azure Seas provides coastal uh, cruises, whale watching, sunset cruises, and private charters, all from Stearns Wharf. Uh, to date, Azure Seas has served more than uh, just under 57,000 passengers since July of 2014. Uh, Whisper is their newest vessel and operates as a six-pack charter and it's an all electric vessel that has uh, served over nearly 4,000 passengers since uh, they came on board in January of 2018. Next slide, please. Those lease terms, license terms, is again, uh, five, <laughs> the first is a five year initial term with one five year option. The base rent would be $2,400. They do pay a percentage rent of 15%, so it's whichever is more. And they also have uh, cost of living increases um, based on the consumer price index. Again, Fred and Kathy Hirschman are consider, considered tenants in good standing uh, by the department. They have no outstanding default notices on file and are always prompt with their payments. Next lease, actually, this time batting third for us. Brophy and Sons uh, for uh, Brophy's Mercantile. Next slide. Brophy's Mercantile, uh, Brophy's Incorporated, Brophy and Sons Incorporated has leased the 521 square foot retail shop at 119C Harbor Way since assuming uh, the lease through a lease assignment process back in November of 2004. Uh, the Mercantile carries a wide assortment of leisure and resort wear, including casual clothing, sandals, sunglasses, beach bags, hats, um, jewelry. They have an amazing collection of Rain Spooner Hawaiian shirts. Trust me, I know. And they also offer sweatshirts and other merchandise imprinted with the Brophy's logo. Next slide. Proposed lease terms, five year term with one five year option. Again, just under um, $2,060 per month or 10% of the gross sales, whichever is greater. And again, a cost of living adjustment uh, increase based on the consumer price index. And finally tonight, batting cleanup, we have Seacoast of Santa Barbara Incorporated, uh, Seacoast Yachts, better known as Seacoast Yachts. Next slide, please. Uh, Seacoast of Santa Barbara Incorporated has operated a yacht brokerage in Santa Barbara under several ownership configurations since uh, about 1971. So they have been here quite a long time. 
Uh, the current lease commenced in 2011 and will expire later this summer. Uh, the lease space includes a number of office suites known as 125 Harbor Way Suites 1, 10, and 11. There's a couple exterior shot as well as an interior shot up on the presentation. Next slide, please. Bay 2 are proposing a five-year term with one five-year option, $2,200 per month, and they have a, a variable percentage rent depending on the type of sales activity. And Bay 2 also have a cost of living increase. And I should say all of these folks, I kind of was a little hit and miss there, are considered tenants in good standing by the department. No outstanding default notices on file and they're always prompt with their payments. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on, on any of those proposed items. On the on the seacoast um, lease, is the is this is that base rent and plus percentage rent or greater of base or percentage? Greater of, yeah. Yes, sorry. Thank you. And they they are always in the greater of. Questions? Um, does anyone, okay, I, I'm hearing no questions. Does anyone uh, feel uh, that we should pull one of these four out and vote on it separately? Uh, if, if not, we can do a voice vote on approving the four of them. Yeah, I would make a motion to approve all four of them. All right, do we have a second? I'll, I'll second that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez, would you do a voice vote for those, please? Yes, of course. Commissioner McRae? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Sloan? Aye. Commissioner Stanowick? Aye. Commissioner Stedman? Aye. Commissioner Kramer? Aye. Yes. Oh, okay. And Chair Sly? Aye. All right. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, do we have any subcommittee reports? Uh, yeah, I can offer up a subcommittee report for everyone. I think. Uh, Director Wilshire alluded to that a little bit earlier, and now that we have the mysterious list server uh, question uh, uh, cleared up, I can tell you that the survey uh, that was sent out by the waterfront went out to, uh, I guess, uh, about a thousand uh, people via email, and they have uh, until the 15th, I guess, or they have until the 15th to respond and a waterfront reports that they've got back about 300 responses so far uh and also we're still compiling data and uh and responses so a lot of this will be given out in a more fulsome report like i mentioned last time uh i guess in august uh like uh mike wilshire said you know we the subcommittee that is jim sloan mike nelson and myself owe the entire commission a full report and we'll do that for you um and i think we might be aiming uh for the finish line in terms of the subcommittee's work so i just wanted to mention that uh as well all right uh if if my two colleagues want to add to that please feel free i think i just want to emphasize that that is the slip transfer subcommittee um, you might have said that, John, but I missed it. But uh, I just no, want to. No, no. Sorry, I, I, we've been doing it so long, Jim. I thought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got. I got we're, we're, we're pretty immersed in it, so yeah. So, but yeah, yeah we're just, pretty. Yeah, um, it, this subcommittee generates a lot of traffic, guys. A lot of dialogue, a lot of uh, outreach, and now we're getting data compiled. So really. Um, it's it's been a lot of work so far. Jim's right. We've been immersed in it, and and Mike Nelson, I think, has been a pretty strong advocate. Emerged as a pretty strong advocate. So uh, I'm I'm really pleased to have worked with uh, both of these guys uh, for a full year now. 
we've been at it. So I hope that's enough for a report, Chair. <laughs> All right, thank you. And we'll, uh, uh, we might see this as a, as a full-blown agenda item in August? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, you're uh, welcome. And uh, I'm not aware, that, I don't believe the uh, commercial fishing subcommittee met since we were last together. Um, is there any, any, anything additional on that? Okay, well, we'll uh, maybe we'll get an update on, uh, on that as well in uh, August. Uh, last time on the agenda is the uh, any commission and or staff communications on any subject. I have one. Okay. It might be of interest to the commission to know that Santa Barbara Harbor was the leading port um, in terms of value of fisheries uh, in the state of California, the leading port. Um, though the poundage was low uh, by almost 50%, our value was the highest in any port in the state of California. And of what? the top 10 species, um, we were the state leader in six of them. Uh, so it really is a, a fascinating statistic. And if you would like to have someone from the commercial fishermen who can go in depth on that talk at some time, they would. But I don't know the last time that Santa Barbara Harbor was, in fact, uh, the leader, state leader in what they call X vessel value or dockside value. Yeah, how, how's that calculated, Mike? Yeah, well, at what time period? period? That just 2020, FY 2020, mm -hmm. uh, the California Fish and Wildlife Department, uh, because they do the the, the e-tickets, uh, they know who sold the fish, what fish they sold, um, and uh, they also know where it was sold. So that's that's how we're just looking at, we're just going through their reports, their annual reports, um, which cover about 200 species. But I just thought it was interesting to note that of those 200 species, the top 10, six of them, we had the top value. So. That's awesome. Now, the reason for that is uh, California spiny lobster went off the charts and was selling for $42 a pound. And of our, 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 our totals was about, you know, 11, $11 million. And of that, half of that was uh, spiny lobster followed by red sea urchin, uh, rock crab and uh, uh, sable fish. That's why we now have $30 Lobster rolls. <laughs> that's all. That's a, great, that's a great report, Mike. I like Good. hearing that. Yeah, really interesting. Um, other comments, Mr. Wilshire? Anything yeah. from your? Chair Sly, I, I just a couple quick ones from staff. So I did just want to reiterate that we've begun the practice of posting correspondence on the Harbor Commission website. Um, although there was none for this meeting, we're going to kind of continue that going forward. So the commission receives your sort of consolidated PDF document of all the correspondence. That's going to get posted publicly as well the day of the meeting. So that's kind of a practice that we're going to we're going to embark on going forward. Yeah, and I think I think that's a good addition. Thanks for doing that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's going to go for kind of all boards and commissions across the city. It's it's. Yeah, there's really no no reason to not make that available. Um, the one other bit of news is I just received news today that the bike share pilot program kind of worked its way through the Coastal Commission and all the approvals and Public Works and B Cycle, the company, they're pretty proactive and they're looking to start installing a couple of the trial bike stations down here in the waterfront as soon as tomorrow. And so we'll see those show up and kind of keep an eye on them and see how they they work. But they're working pretty directly with our facility staff to get those installed. And those will be the locations that that you all went over last uh, last meeting. So we'll we'll see. But just wanted to give you a heads up that those may start showing up as as soon as this weekend. Very cool. That's that's it for me. All right. Awesome. 
Yeah, and uh, thank Eric for adding in the uh, Harbor Patrol blotter. That was exciting. <laughs> yeah, that was a little trial run. If you, if you like that, that can that can be repeated. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, I think it's interesting to know, you know, we might otherwise assume that it's just always quiet down there. And I think we all know that it's that's not the case, but it's uh, I think it's nice for the for that part of the staff to get uh, some recognition of uh, all the work they do and uh, some harrowing things that uh, go on, like people driving out on the breakwater. Um, all right. Last chance for comments or questions. I'd move to adjourn. Do we have a second? A second. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, thank you all, commissioners and staff, as always, for uh, spending your evening hours with us. And uh, hopefully we'll all see each other in person, maybe in August. Thanks a lot, Lang. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Nice to see you. Bye.